thank you for uh, that great introduction. And I can say that I am a big enthusiast of the plant-based diet. Um, and my area of expertise, as was mentioned in the introduction, is superbugs. And there was a time not too long ago uh, when I was busy working on this book and I was sitting at the dinner table across from my wife, who's a physician, and I could see that she was very deep in thought. And I had a stack of fungal journals on the dining table and I was busy at work. And I saw her squinting and I said, what are you thinking about? And she said, of all the guys in the world, how did I end up married to the yeast infection guy? <laughs> and for better or worse, that is what I'm known as uh, at my hospital. I'm a staff physician at New York Presbyterian, which is based in Manhattan, and we have satellite campuses all over um, New York, and probably gonna have some near here soon. Um, but I begin by telling you that because this idea of superbugs um, encompasses a whole wide variety of infectious diseases, which is my specialty. And traditionally, superbugs have been thought to be drug-resistant bacteria. But we now know that it's a much bigger issue than that, that superbugs also pertains to drug-resistant parasites, drug-resistant fungi, things like yeast and mold, uh, and also drug-resistant viruses. And in the course of the, today's talk, we'll cover all kinds of, of, uh, of superbugs, um, including some of the first to be identified and then some of the newest ones that have just um, been in the news lately, such as the coronavirus from the Wuhan province. And I want today to be interactive. Um, I'm gonna talk for a while, and then I'm gonna open it up for questions, because I know that there is a, a lot of misinformation, there's a lot of confusion, but there's also a lot of, uh, of very interesting thoughts that you may have, and I, I often learn something just listening to um, people in the crowd. And before I get going, I'll say probably the most interesting question I've ever gotten was in Richmond, Virginia, a man raised his hand and said, you know how locusts were cast upon the earth in the Bible as a judgment for human behavior? Do you think superbugs were cast upon the earth as a judgment for our behavior? And that video of me answering that question is on C-SPAN, you can Google it. Um, but it caught me off guard and there was quite a bit of fumbling uh, before I was able to answer the question, which is yes. Um, we have contributed substantially to superbugs. Um, and I'm gonna get to how that happened. And then I also wanna put this all in perspective. I think we all have enough to worry about day in and day out, that I want this to be calibrated appropriately on your list of things that concern you. Uh, because I'm an infectious disease specialist and when I go home at night to my two young children and my wife, I'm not worried that I'm going to be transmitting some deadly thing to them even though that's what I spend all day dealing with. And so I wanna highlight why this is important, how we got here and what we're doing about it, but also put it in some perspective. So I wanna begin by telling you a little bit about the book that I wrote, Superbugs. So a few years ago, I was trying to figure out how do I talk about this issue? Because I was getting, as an infectious disease specialist, I was getting emails from friends and family all the time about articles in the news. You've probably seen plenty of these uh, newspaper headlines of new superbug, you know, MRSA does this, or outbreak of superbug in New Mexico. But one of the things that I noticed time and time again about these articles is that there was something missing from them. And that thing that was missing was the patients. It was often a story about the bacterium, about the science behind it, which was fascinating, or about the policies that had led to this or what was being done from a policy, policy perspective to address it, kind of the 30,000 foot view. But it was missing the thing that I was seeing all the time, which was the patients who were coming into the emergency room, who were scared and who were vulnerable, and their stories weren't being told. Um, part of that is because the journalists who were writing these articles didn't have access to them. And I'm gonna talk a little bit later today about that issue of writing about patients, real patients, and how that's a, a, a tricky subject. But for someone like me who writes all the time about medicine, uh, it's a, a crucial aspect of telling these stories. So a few years ago, um, I was in the emergency room of New York Presbyterian, and a patient came in, uh, I call him Jackson, he was an African-American mechanic from Queens. 
and he had been shot, and there was a bullet lodged in his leg. And the area surrounding the bullet was infected. And when I was peering over to see him, I had a team of medical students and residents with me, and one of them handed me a piece of paper, which revealed the results of a microbiological test. And when I looked at it, my eyes bulged, because it showed that the bacterium that was in his leg was a superbug. It had become resistant to every antibiotic that we had at our disposal except for one. And that one was something called colistin. I don't know if there are any clinicians in the room or pharmacists, but colistin is a very strong antibiotic that was discovered more than a generation ago. And it was something that we stopped using 25 years ago because it is so toxic. So colistin is really good at destroying uh, bacteria, but it also can destroy your kidneys in the process. It can destroy your brain. It can destroy internal organs. So years ago, we made the decision as doctors to stop using it because it was simply too toxic. But I found myself staring into the eyes of this nervous guy saying, I might have to use this drug which could potentially clear your infection, but might wipe out your kidneys in the process and might put you into di on dialysis, might totally ruin your life because of a skin infection. And so a number of things were round, popping through my head as I was seeing this guy. Uh, one of which was, I'm on the ethics committee, and I found myself dealing with an ethical issue, which is, can I ethically justify treating this guy's infection if I might destroy other organs in the process? One of the other things I was wondering is, why did a stray bullet from Queens have a superbug on it? How did that happen? And then more importantly, why didn't we have any better treatment options for him? So all of this was spinning around in my head and it was in that moment that I decided to write my book. And if you flip through the pages of it, you'll see that anecdote is what begins my story. And from there, what happens? And what happens to Jackson? And it becomes one of many patients who I follow and who I continue to follow. Uh, I gave a talk, uh, not far from here actually, and at, at the end of the talk somebody came up to me and said, hey, remember me? I'm, your, I'm in your book. I had the super bug. You cured me. I thought, oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> so if anyone here has seen me before, please raise their hand <laughs> and, and let me know. Um, but what happened was after I saw Jackson, I walked across the hall to my mentor. And the reason that I am known as the yeast infection guy is that I trained with the world expert in yeast infections. It's a guy named Tom Walsh, and he is an expert in infectious diseases, pediatrics, hematology, oncology, pathology, and fungal infections. And I met him a dozen years ago and immediately decided this is the guy who I want to work with. And when I went into his office that day after seeing Jackson, he had this big smile on his face, and he said, I've got an opportunity for us. And really, Matt, it's an opportunity for you. And that opportunity was to run a clinical trial with a new antibiotic that had just been approved by the FDA. It's a drug called Dalbavancin. And the reason we were gonna study it is that our hospital, like many hospitals around the country, was in a standoff with the maker of that antibiotic. It was this really powerful new drug that could cure a superbug infection, many superbug infections. But the company said, we're going to charge $4,000 a dose. And my hospital said, thank you, but no thank you. And that was the standoff. So we weren't carrying it. And that led me on this quest to understand how did we get to this point. One of the biggest misconceptions about superbugs is that we're running out of antibiotics. But this isn't true. There's antibiotics being approved by the FDA all the time. There was a new antibiotic approved last month called Cefidrocol. My hospital doesn't carry it. It's not going to carry it. I guarantee you your hospital doesn't either. And we're going to talk about why that is and what's being done about it, because there's a lot being done about it. Um, there are one of, one of the most exciting things about working with superbugs is that every day is full of discovery. People are discovering new antibiotics all the time, and I help figure out whether they should continue studying it and what patients will need it most. And that's the thrill of doing this job.